Hey, real quick, I, I did want to apologize for last week. Uh, if you weren't here, we looked at the story of Mary and Martha, and I, and I had mentioned um, just just for that one Sunday. So don't, if I didn't list your name, don't realize that I, I know you help. Uh, that how many Marthas we need just to pull off one Sunday of service and. Uh, you know, I had mentioned Howard and said, you know, that, that he, a Martha, a hideous-looking Martha, but a Martha nonetheless. <laughs> and he came up to me after service, and he said, why, why was I the only one that you said was hideous-looking? Um, so I guess he wanted me to point out some of the rest of you, so I got a list here. So, <laughs> I'm just kidding. He, he said, you know, he asked me, and I went home, and the more I thought about that, I stand by it. But I did want to apologize to Danny and Debbie because they're here faithfully every Sunday, passing out bulletins and greetings. So two more Marthas. So that's up to 29 last week. So, all right. Anyway, there we go. Let's do this. Um, uh, if sort of two classic responses that you'll get from unchurched people as to why they don't attend church, uh, because the church is full of hypocrites and because all the church wants is your money. Those two things are usually pretty high up there. In fact, um, if you are familiar with the Barna Group, they've done research forever. Uh, they've really started to do research for the church, uh, do extensive um, studies, some years long, even a decades long, stuff to try and help the church uh, and, and growing and, and just collecting information. And so uh, a recent study, uh, the number one reason that millennials don't or say they don't go to church is because of hypocrisy, because the church is full of hypocrites. So we've got those two things, hypocrisy and uh, don't want to be somewhere that only wants uh, their money. Now, uh, you know, like the, the, if someone said that to me, uh, and this is just the snarkiness in me, I uh, would want to say, you know, that's why casinos and Walmart have never made it in Oklahoma, right? <laughs> because no one wants to go to someplace that only wants your money. Of course, that, that whole, that's hypocritical, isn't it? Um, except for, I, would, I wouldn't say that because obviously that's unloving. That wouldn't be helpful in that conversation. Um, so I wouldn't say that. But also I wouldn't say that because that's actually not hypocrisy. Uh, the way that we've come to define hypocrisy is generally speaking saying one thing and then doing another. That's, that's the way that we've kind of in our culture defined hypocrisy. That's not hypocrisy. That's just moral failure. I mean, if the thing that you're saying to do or the thing that you're saying not to do, um, if, if that's good, and then you do the opposite, that's not hypocrisy. That's just sin. And so in that sense, the church is full uh, of hypocrites if you define hypocrisy that way, which is incorrect. Uh, we're just sin. That's all people. We're all, uh, we're all sinners. Um, everyone's guilty of that. Uh, but, but more than that, um, hypocrisy if we're just defining it as saying one thing and doing another, that's not always even bad, is it? Uh, we do this all the time as parents. Teachers, I'm sure, probably do it. Um, where you tell your child not to do one thing and then you turn around and immediately do it. Uh, now, that can be bad, but many times you tell your child not to do something because that thing isn't appropriate for a child, but it is appropriate for an adult. And therefore, not only is that not hypocrisy, that's God honoring, okay? So when we're talking about hypocrisy, we're not talking about just saying one thing and doing the opposite. So we're going to get into our sixth meal here in our series of the Lord's Suppers, and Jesus is going to just uh, combat, um, confront hypocrisy head on. And you can go to Luke chapter 11. There's a parallel text in Matthew chapter 23, uh, but we're going to be in Luke chapter 11. Uh, and Jesus gets invited to this meal. And, I mean, the meal hasn't even started. And I have a feeling uh, that the people who have invited, whoever it was that invited Jesus to this meal, probably regrets that they did it. I mean, before the meals even started, because Jesus comes hard at them. And, and that's just important for us because this is uh, perhaps uh, the most, it's certainly one of the most condemning remarks that Jesus makes in all of Scripture. And so when we hear that, our ears ought to perk up. You know, we ought to have ears to hear and say, okay, how does this apply to me? Uh, what, what can I glean from what Jesus is doing here in this meal? So let's go to Luke chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 37. Uh, we're going to go through 41 here. It says, while Jesus was speaking, 
A Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went in and reclined at the table. And the Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give his alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. So this Pharisee's invited Jesus to this meal. When Jesus comes in, he doesn't wash his hands, uh, which was not required by the Old Testament law, What not what's going on here. Uh, it wasn't done for hygienic purposes. This is about ceremonial uh, cleanliness. And the idea is that you come to this meal, or earlier in your day, before you come to this meal, I suppose, you've touched something unclean. Perhaps you've bumped into a uh, non-Jew. You've, you bumped into a Gentile. You, therefore, would be unclean. You come in and wash the hands so that you might be made clean so that then you don't contaminate, make unclean everyone else at this meal. And so Jesus comes in and the Pharisees are astonished that he has skipped the hand washing. And it doesn't say whether Jesus sort of uh, perceived what was in their hearts or uh, if there was some sort of physical reaction to Jesus or if they said something. We're not sure. But whatever happened here, uh, Jesus responds, and, and I have a feeling... Uh, that they instantly regretted it because for the next 14 verses, Jesus just completely, I mean, this entire meal just completely destroys um, what in his mind, what in his eyes, which of course would make it true, is their hollow religion. Um, and so, uh, and, and I want you to notice, we're only going to read half the meal. We're just going to talk about the Pharisees. He goes on in the second half, talks to the teachers of the law. But, but there's no compassion here. Last week when, when Jesus corrected Martha, we talked about that Martha, Martha. There was some compassion in the rebuke. That There was some compassion in the, in the correction. Uh, there's none of that here. Only condemnation for the way that these people have conducted themselves. And so he begins with this idea of hand washing. And I want to read something to you here. This is, this is from the Mishnah. Uh, so just for lack of a better phrase, the Mishnah is a J- Jewish rule book. Um, But I want to read to you some of the requirements uh, about hand washing. And again, not biblical, not Old Testament law. This is just what is in addition to what God requires for ceremonial cleanliness. The hands are susceptible to uncleanness, and they are rendered clean up to the wrist. Thus, if a man had poured the first water up to the wrist and the second water beyond the wrist, the water flowed back to the hand, the hand becomes clean. But if he poured both the first water and the second beyond the wrist, and the water flowed back to the hand, the hand remains unclean. If he poured the first water over the one hand, and then bethought himself, and poured the second water over the one hand, his one hand is clean. If he had poured the water over the one hand, and rubbed it on the other, it becomes unclean. But if he rubbed it on his head or on the wall, it remains clean. What? Does any of you know what you're supposed to do? We're talking about two cups. Somewhere in the middle of that, we start talking about two hands. So I don't know if we're dealing with our left hand or our right hand through this. And at the very end, we're rubbing our hands on our heads and walls, right? Which we would seem unclean. Any of you ever went to the bathroom and finished up with this or, you know, Miyagi'd the wall? Probably not, right? That would make you think it was unclean. uh, But apparently in the Mishnah, that means clean. I mean, think about if you walked in, if this was the custom, you walked into some public restroom that, you know, I know it isn't ladies' restroom, but guys' restroom, there's all, all, multiple sinks. You know, the people are doing their thing, and you just start scrubbing, and you'd be like, A, B, C, D. Because that's all I know, right? That's the only thing I knew, is I was supposed to scrub my hands while I sang the alphabet song, and then I was good. That made me clean. But apparently, I'm supposed to be pouring cups uh, from wrist to elbow, but not from there to there, but on the left hand. Second cup on the, I mean, I mean, who knows? And this is what Jesus is dealing with. This is what Jesus is concerned with because there's a a preoccupation uh, with the outside of things. There's a preoccupation with the cleanliness uh, of external things. And so Jesus compares them to dirty dishes that are washed on the outside uh, but not the inside. See, they've gone through all the steps of being outwardly righteous. But inside, Jesus said, they're full of greed and wickedness. And then he calls them fools. And that's not an, well, I mean, it is insulting. That's not the way we use the word fools. It literally means your heads are empty. You have no understanding of what you're doing. Um, so, you know, Jesus obviously can't stand this sort of behavior, of way of 
not thinking, so to speak. Uh, do any of you guys have one of those late night Oreo and milk eaters that refuses to wash the dish? <laughs> you, you No, man, you can't say that about your wife. <laughs> oh, it was a kid. It was a kid. It was the kid. Okay, okay. All right, all right. I'm sorry. That was the kid. Okay. Um, or were you confessing? Oh, okay, okay. Well, we've probably all experienced, right? You wake up in the morning, you look in this glass, and it's this horrible mess of just Oreo floaty crumble things and something that doesn't even resemble milk. It's more like runny cottage cheese at this point because whoever in your family can't just rinse out a dish, right? And it's just absolutely disgusting, okay? Now, imagine you go to someone's house for dinner. They've invited you over for dinner. You, you come in. I mean, the, the room is immaculate. It's, just, it's wonderful, it's clean, the table itself is beautiful, the table is set wonderfully, the food looks delicious, the lighting in the room has got you just so relaxed. I mean, everything about this seems wonderful. And then the host comes over to you and he's got this pitcher of what just looks like the most refreshing drink you've ever had. It's a glass pitcher, you can see the fruit in there, it just looks so good. And they get it and they pour you a glass and he hands you the glass And it's this wonderful drink sitting on top of that milk Oreo science experiment thing. You leave that meal. The only thing you're telling your friends or anyone else about, the only thing you're remembering is not all that other stuff. The only thing you're thinking about is that disgusting glass that they gave you a glass. And they said, well, we don't wash the inside. We just wash the outside right? That's the only thing you're talking about. That's the only thing you're going to remember. And that's Jesus's problem with these people. Jesus says, this is what religion is like. When religion is all on the outside, when it's all external, but the heart hasn't been transformed, you're bringing to me this nastiness, and I reject it. All the other stuff, if that's what's inside, all the other stuff is meaningless, Okay, so let's go on here. Luke chapter 11, verse 42. And Jesus is going to get more um, sort of confrontational with them, even more uh, serious, I would say. Verse 42, he says, But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So this is the first of three woes that Jesus is going to speak to these Pharisees. And again, when you hear the word woe, especially from the mouth of Jesus, Man, the ears need to perk up because woe, and we don't use this word, obviously. Anyone, I don't, anyone ever woed someone? Probably not. Um, when you woe someone, you're passing judgment on them, and you're actually um, uh, speaking condemnation, suffering, anguish, sorrow upon them. So what Jesus is saying is suffering and anguish upon you Pharisees for this behavior. Now, this isn't just like, hey, you ought to shape up. This is no, suffering is going to come upon you because of what you're doing here. And what they're doing here is they're tithing these things uh, that, again, aren't required by the law. Now, they ought to tithe. Tithing is part of the law. That's good. But what they've done is they've gone and made the, the law harder externally. And you can imagine, like, what it would be to tithe these things. I mean, look at what he says here. Uh, mint, rue, and every herb. Think about how hard it would be. Uh, to tie the tenth of those things. Uh, some, uh, so, and some other, in Matthew it says cumin, uh, but just think about like going and, and counting all those tiny little seeds because you're a Pharisee, so you have to have exactly a tenth to get into that. I mean, think about how difficult they made this law. And notice Jesus doesn't condemn them for what's going on outside. In fact, in fact he commends them for what's going on outside. He says, these things are good, but without inward change, they're they're worthless. What you ought to have done is to have done these things, but to also love justice and have the love of God. But you don't. You reject those things, and therefore the tithing is worthless. Woe be upon you. And then in verse 44, woe to you, or excuse me, 43. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace. So again, anguish, suffering, sorrow be upon you because you love to be elevated in the minds and hearts of others. That's what your great concern is, but you've given no concern for what's inside of your own heart and mind. And then verse 44, woe to you for you are like unmarked graves. People walk over them without knowing it. 
So to come into contact with the grave in Jesus' day would to make you unclean. And so what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees is that you guys are so dirty. You're so full of dead bones that people are coming into contact with you and your, your death is influencing them. Your death is, is coming, uh, becoming their death. You're making others unclean. And so you look through these three woes and you look at the, the, the first thing, the hand washing, and there's a clear theme running through this. And that is that these people are concerned with the outward, pretending outwardly with no concern at all what's going on inside. And that's hypocrisy. This is what Jesus calls hypocrisy. And he doesn't call it that here. It's implied here in Luke. Matthew chapter 23, same story, repeatedly refers to the Pharisees as hypocrites. And the word hypocrite is from the Greek word hypocritus, um, which is not an insult in their day. It just it meant an actor. That's what an actor was. But it literally meant to interpret from underneath. So in Jesus' day, when you would act, you would wear a mask, obviously, uh, um, to, and that was sort of the costume uh, that would make it easier for people to see. Uh, so you wear a mask, and then you would interpret the story from underneath the mask. So that's what the word hypocrite means, to interpret from underneath, to wear the mask. And so when Jesus calls them hypocrites, he's saying you are acting, you are pretending to be something outwardly that you are not inwardly. You're wearing the mask of righteousness, but inside you're corrupt. So it's not saying one thing and doing another. It's pretending to be something outwardly that is inconsistent altogether with what's going on inwardly. Uh, flip over to Revelation chapter 3. Uh, in the book of Revelation, before you get to all the apocalyptic stuff, Jesus addresses uh, seven churches. And some of these churches he's got some condemnation for. Some of these churches he's got um, uh, praise for, uh, commendation. Um, uh, but uh, the church to Sardis, uh, this church in the city of Sardis, um, he's got some rebuke, some concern. Uh, the, the history of Sardis helps us a little bit here. So Sardis was a very powerful uh, city. It's the most powerful city in that region. Uh, it's the capital uh, of the, the Lydian uh, kingdom. Uh, Sardis was uh, influential, powerful, wealthy. I mean, everything you would want in your city, Sardis was this. This is just previous to maybe 100 or so years prior to Jesus' uh, coming to earth. Uh, physically. Um, and so Sardis got everything going on for it, except for uh, twice it has allowed itself to be attacked in the middle of the night. And so the city has been plundered uh, and kind of ruined. Uh, and so the thing that it used to have, it does not have, uh, but it's still got this reputation. And so this is what Jesus is going to address. It's got a reputation that uh, the city does that, that exceeds its present reality. And so Jesus is going to address these things. So Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. So he makes a clear connection. I don't think these people could have missed between the city of Sardis and the church that's in Sardis. And that is the city had this reputation that, that exceeded the reality and now this church has this reputation that has exceeded its reality. And you, 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 you have this reputation of being alive, of being shiny and beautiful. But Jesus says, you're actually almost dead. In fact, he says, you are dead. But wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. What Jesus is addressing here in this church is hypocrisy. They're very much like the Pharisees, whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Uh, to me, that was one of, when we went to Israel, one of the great sort of object lessons is you can sit on the southern steps of the temple and you can look across the valley uh, to the Mount of Olives and there's all these I mean, it's, it's, it's tomb, so however beautiful that can be. But it's, it's a beautiful scene, all these whitewashed tombs <clears throat> across there on the side of that uh, a mountain. And, and Jesus is telling the Pharisees, just look across the valley. That's you. You look pretty externally, 
But what's inside those tombs is dead men's bones. And that's you. And that's the warning that he's got here for this church, that you are dying of hypocrisy. You are dead because of hypocrisy. But then in verse 3, he gives the cure. Verses 1 and 2, um, he, he makes a prognosis. He gives the diagnosis. Verse 3, he gives the cure. He says, remember then what you have received and had heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will know, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Remember what you have received and heard. Well, what had they had received and heard? They had received the gospel. They had heard the gospel and then received new life. Remember, that's, that's what the gospel is, that you were once dead in your trespasses, and because of Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, you now have new life through faith in that. And Jesus says, hold on to that. Remember that you used to be dead. And you have been made alive. And so when you come to this moment of being dead, when your reputation outshines what's actually going on inside, hold fast to what you originally received so that you may be made alive again, so that you may breathe and live again. And what goes on inside matches what's going on in the outside. And apparently this church must have taken Jesus' words to heart because 14 centuries later, the city of Sardis is just completely abandoned. And 14 centuries later, this church, the Christian church that was in Sardis, was still there. We're at 50 years, all right? We got 1,350 more to go, okay? Because these people held to what was true, to what they had once received and heard. The gospel is the cure to hypocrisy. So what's the application for us? Where are we going for this? What do we need to remember for this? And and I think Palm Sunday is such a great Sunday. I'm thankful I didn't plan it this way. This meal, I just made a list of eight meals and this meal fell on this day. But I think it's perfect for this. Uh, Because we've come to this Sunday where we remember Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, that last week of his life. And as he came, uh, the people are celebrating him. Uh, They're praising him, adoration. And they take off their cloaks and they lay them down on the ground so they ride upon branches and they wave them and they celebrate him and they say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. So think about what they got there just in that one proclamation. Hosanna, my goodness. Uh, they called, G- I think my ears shrunk or something. Um, they called Jesus uh, Hosanna, Savior, saved. They called him Lord, and they called him King. I mean, they got it exactly right in one sentence. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. They said it's as great a thing as you can say about Jesus that Sunday, right? That Sunday, Jesus gets up, or not gets up, he leaves Jerusalem that day. He goes out of town. He comes back in the next morning. And as he's coming back in, he and the disciples look over, and there's a fig tree. And there's two important things that we're told about this fig tree. One is it's it's the summer, it's in leaf, okay? And the other is uh, that there's no fruit, that that, that it's not the season for figs. So Jesus goes over to this fig tree, even though it's not the season for figs, sees that it has no figs on it, and curses it so that it will never produce figs again. And you ask that question, well, why would you do that? That seems... Uh, mean, mean-hearted. That seems like a tough thing for Jesus to do. I mean, if that tree is supposed to represent anything in our life, and for Jesus just to condemn it because it was not doing the thing that he had designed it not to do at that time, I mean, if you really believe that Jesus created all things, then he's the one that made that tree to not be producing figs at that point. So, well, why would Jesus do that? And I think it's because the tree was in leaf. It had the appearance that it ought to be producing fruit. Externally, it looked exactly like it ought to have fruit on it. But internally, what was going on inside was not producing fruit. That's Monday. So we've got palm waving on, uh, on, on uh, Sunday in condemnation of a non-producing fig tree on Monday. And it's no coincidence that these two uh, uh, branch-related incidents are back-to-back in the Gospels as we hear about Jesus's, the last week of Jesus' life. Um, 
because they point to the reality, the spiritual reality of, of Israel, much of Israel, which was people who uh, at once were praising Jesus with their lips and at the same time were rejecting him by being fruitless in their lives. Jesus says it this way, you honor me with your lips, uh, but your hearts are far from me. That's hypocrisy. To honor externally, but to be corrupt internally is hypocrisy. To pretend to be something outside that you are not inside is hypocrisy. And I don't believe that the church is full of hypocrites. Are there hypocrites in the church? Probably so. In fact, we know there are. We've heard stories. But I don't believe the church is full of hypocrites. But I do believe that the church is full of sinners. I do believe the church is full of people who say one thing and then do the other. That's all of us. That's all of our condition. And hypocrisy is not a condition. Hypocrisy is a sin. And as sinners, we're susceptible to the sin of hypocrisy. And so I think for us, as we examine our own self, that's what we ought to do. Jesus says, repent. Well, how can you repent if you haven't examined yourself and know what to repent of? If you haven't prayed to God, show me, God, where I need repentance in my life. And so as we think about Palm Sunday, I think here's the question I would want to end with, is that each of us ought to ask ourselves, where in our lives are we waving our branches on Sunday and then not producing fruit on Monday? Because that's hypocrisy, and each of us is susceptible to that thing. What good is it to wave our branches on Sunday if we don't produce fruit on Monday. Let's pray. God, thank you uh, for being kind to us. And again, God, uh, I want to pray for your spirit to move in us, to reveal in us areas, God, where we need repentance. Um, We can never know where we need repentance, God, without your spirit convicting us. Um, and, And we're thankful for repentance, this constant turning towards you because we know that you accept us. You know that every time we turn to you, we, we know every time we turn to you, you accept us. You want us to draw near to you. You want us to examine ourselves so that we would be pure inside. God, you want the good on the outside. Everything we're going to do here in, in just a minute, or we've done already, God, you want from us. You want these religious practices. They're good and God-glorifying, but you want our inside to match that, God. And so I pray that through your spirit, uh, you will cleanse us, you will convict us, you will encourage us where we've done or are doing good, and that you will make us more like you, that you will transform us into the likeness of your son so that the world can no longer say of us that the church is full of hypocrites, but at least the ones that we have influence over and, and the ones that we are around can only say, That person has been changed by Christ. There's something completely different about that person. I don't know what it is, but I want to know what it is. And God, you would give us the opportunity to share the gospel with other people because there's no hypocrisy in us. So cleanse us, God. Make us pure. We love you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.